This video will discuss orthogonalization, or how we go about finding an orthonormal basis set in the hartree fock roton equations. Okay, let's we'll start off by reminding ourselves that the overlap matrix between uh, pairs of uh, basis functions is s mu nu, uh, s matrix, uh, its element s mu nu being the integral over all space of phi mu star phi nu where a particular phi is one basis function in a basis set where we have uh, basis functions going from 1 to k. And um, a, some linear combination of those is what represents our individual uh, molecular orbitals in hartree fock So this, this video is going to answer the question, how do we go about ensuring that we end up with an orthonormal basis set such that our overlap matrix is an identity matrix. So the secret to doing that is going to unsurprisingly involve matrix transformations. So we're going to get some transformed set of basis functions, phi mu prime, which is going to be related to the initial basis functions through some transformation matrix. So sum nu equals 1 to k of x mu nu times phi phi nu is going to give us our transformed orbitals, how much of each of the old orbitals is contributing to the new orbital. And as long as our orbitals are sufficiently complete, we can represent almost any new uh, basis function we like, uh, in depending on the correct transformation matrix we choose. Okay, so if I have the overlap uh, matrix element of two transformed orbitals, the result of that is going to come from uh, two transformations, one in the complex conjugate and one in the basis function itself. Here we have the index going over what I call lambda. Here we have going over sigma. And in this case, we could factor out uh, both of those. Uh, we could factor out that double sum. We could factor out these constants, uh, x star mu lambda and x nu sigma, as I've done there. Then we have the integral on the inside of uh, phi lambda star phi sigma. And this is also equal to, uh, if we define a density matrix based off of these two uh, overlap integral, uh, based off of this overlap integral, equals the double sum over lambda and sigma of x star mu sigma s sigma, or x star mu lambda s lambda sigma x nu sigma, which is also equal to s mu nu, or s mu prime nu prime. So if we choose this x, x matrix such that we end up with an identity matrix as a result, or at the very least that we end up with some diagonal matrix, then what this has shown here is basically that we get x dagger s x equals some diagonal matrix. And we also know that S has to be a Hermitian matrix. So we're, in a sense here, using a unitary transformation to diagonalize this Hermitian matrix. So it's a question of uh, what Hermitian matrix should we use in order to diagonalize or orthogonalize um, this, per this particular matrix of interest. All right, so the first case is what we would call symmetric orthogonalization where this transformation matrix we're going to use is actually the inverse square root matrix of the S matrix itself. So you can imagine for matrices, just like for variables or functions, that the square root of a matrix is the matrix you have to multiply by itself to get that matrix back. And of course the inverse is the matrix you multiply a matrix by to get an identity matrix. So the s to the minus one half matrix is just you know in a similar kind of vein. So, in order to get the s to the minus one half matrix, what we're going to do is um, take the unitary matrix which diagonalizes s, um, and we're going to make that diagonalization. And then once it's diagonal, um, you take each diagonal element to the negative one half power. Um, there is a uh, physical chemistry math review playlist video specifically on this type of operation. So if this seems completely confusing, um, please go review that video. So we're going to take the diagonalized and then uh, 
taken to the negative one half power matrix, and then we're going to do the reverse unitary transformation in order to get our uh, s to the negative one half matrix that we're going to use for this orthogonalization. So we can see here that if we multiply s to the negative one half on one side, then s, then s to the negative one half on the other side, the result is going to be s to the zero power, which is in fact an identity matrix. So that's a good check mark for us because an identity matrix will be diagonalized. So this type of orthogonalization is called symmetric orthogonalization, where we're just using this uh, s to the negative one half on each side and symmetrically orthogonalizing the result. So symmetric orthogonalization is not always possible, um, particularly because not every matrix actually has an inverse. And if you can't invert a matrix, that is, if you can't find uh, s to the negative 1, then you can't find s to the negative 1 half. And the reason for that is, as you add more and more basis functions, um, basis functions get more and more similar the more you add to them. And eventually, they're within numerical noise, you eventually end up with um, eigenvectors there that look the same. And that results in uh, weird things where you can't invert this anymore. So in the special case where you can't uh, invert the matrix anymore, you have, to use, you have to use an alternative called canonical orthogonalization instead. And for canonical orthogonalization, what we use is this transformation matrix is the unitary matrix we use to diagonalize it times s to the negative one half, where we have actually lopped off and truncated a few of the uh, lowest order terms in this s to the negative one half part. Okay, so our xij, the actual elements of our transformation matrix are going to be the elements of the uh, unitary matrix divided by the square root of our diagonal elements of our overlap matrix. So this is going to be this is going to be an okay thing to do as long as those diagonal elements aren't sufficiently close to zero. And if they are sufficiently close to zero, we're just going to ignore them and lop off uh, those values. So then uh, the multiplication or the unitary transformation x dagger s x, uh, we can show here through these types of matrix operations that um, ends up being equivalent to getting us an identity matrix. U s to the minus one half dagger is uh, s u s to the negative one half. Um, this is going to be equal to u dagger s u u s to the minus one half dagger is going to be s to the minus one half dagger u dagger. Um, when you do that, you flip the order and apply the adjoint to everything. This matrix is diagonal, so it is its adjoint is itself. So we drop the 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 dagger. Uh, we keep the dagger for for the u that's in there, and then we have s u s to the negative one half, and then if we uh, factorize it this way, indicate the u dagger s u. That's just what we would do in order to diagonalize s. So now we get the diagonal representation s or lowercase s there. So we have little s to the negative one half, at little s, little s to the negative one half, and that is equal to s to the zero or an identity matrix. So in both cases, we're doing the same thing, but there's a little bit of an intermediate step in canonical orthogonalization, which gets rid of the headaches that occur whenever we have uh, some of these uh, diagonal elements of the S matrix being very close to zero, leading us not to be able to invert them. Okay, so once we figure out what this diagonal form of the S matrix is for canonical orthogonalization, um, we're going to sort all of those elements, those diagonal elements by, by their magnitude, and we are going to discard the smallest of values. So usually there will be some threshold like 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 12, who knows. Some numerical threshold where if it's below that we just discard it and then we have fewer rows in the resulting matrix. So the result is what we would call x tilde. And x tilde is the resulting unitary matrix uh, divided where the columns are divided by um, that diagonal element to the one-half power, um, but we are just stopping at the rows uh, wherever, we, wherever we're not concerned about it anymore. So instead of, having, um, instead of having k columns that we do, we only have k minus m columns. 
sorry, I was mentioning rows earlier. It's actually the number of columns that we lop off. So our, our pruned or our truncated uh, transformation matrix has is K by K minus M or um, K, a K by K minus M matrix where we have discarded the smallest M, which are below our uh, numerical cutoff threshold. So then instead of getting... Um, Instead of getting k basis functions back, we actually get k minus m basis functions back where we have removed the redundancy in whatever basis functions are there. Um, but we'll discuss more, this more in detail in the basis function chapter, but that is quite a ways down the line and not of much concern for now. Okay, so if we, uh, take, if we take our coefficient matrix and we multiply it by the inverse of this transformation matrix we use to diagonalize the S matrix, we get our transformed C matrix. Or, and our original C matrix is just this transformation matrix times our transformed C matrix. So doing a bit of linear algebra here, what we can show is that if we have X times X times C prime, which is basically just F times C, as we saw earlier. Then we have on the right-hand side, S times X times C prime times epsilon. So we have that. And then if we left multiply by X dagger, what we get on the left-hand side is X dagger F X times C prime. On the right-hand side, we get X dagger S X C prime epsilon. So this x dagger s x, as we've defined according to our orthogonalization definition, is going to give us an identity matrix. So this goes away. And this value that we get on the left-hand side, this f dagger x dagger f x, this is what we're going to call f prime, or our transformed Fock matrix. So in fact, what we get is f prime times c prime equals c prime times epsilon. So what we've got here is using this transformed Fock matrix, we act, we act on our transformed coefficient matrix, and that gives us a transformed coefficient matrix times our orbital energies. So for F prime mu nu, that's going to be all of our Fock matrix elements of our transformed uh, basis functions. And our atomic orbitals in such a case are going to be the transformed basis functions as a linear making a linear combination using the transformed C matrix. So that's a lot of abstraction to discuss how we actually go about um, diagonalizing the Fock matrix to find what these orbital energies and coefficient matrices are. And we're going to discuss now in the next video the final full-blown uh, algorithmic procedure that we're going to use to systematically solve for the molecular orbitals and orbital energies of an arbitrary Hartree-Fock uh, chemical system.